So many of the Bibles that you pick up, you open to the New Testament, and you're going to discover that there's letters that are read. Typically, those words represent words spoken by Jesus. And the Bibles that have chosen to do that do it for a number of reasons. Um, they do it so that you can quickly identify words spoken by Jesus. They do it so that you can easily focus on what Jesus said during his life and ministry on earth. They do it to emphasize the importance of the things that Jesus had to say. And some would even imply that it is done so that when you're reading the New Testament, uh, specifically the Gospels, you can feel as though Jesus is speaking directly to you. But I really love the concept that the words of Jesus are in red letters because it represents Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. In other words, the red represents his blood. And so as you're reading those words, it is to remind you that Jesus paid the price for you to hear those words with his own blood. And so therefore, you should sense his deep love as you're reading those words and realize that he really did give an incredible sacrifice for us to be able to hear what he had to say. Now, here's the other thing. We talked about this last Sunday. It was an anchor text through us, that anchor text for us kind of throughout the worship service, and that is this, that the Bible actually goes as far as to say that if, we, if they had have tried to record all the things that Jesus did and all the things that Jesus said, there would not be enough books to do that. So the New Testament and the Gospels really just gives us a snippet of things Jesus said and Jesus did, but still it is absolutely prolific. Now, when you start to evaluate the red letters, what you're going to discover is the number one thing that Jesus talked about is the kingdom of heaven. And last week we talked in that vein and how that we can learn a lot about our relationships and how to live them more effectively because of Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of heaven. Today we're going to talk about the second most discussed thing in Jesus' preaching and in Jesus' teaching. But before we dive into that, I need to kind of set it up in this way. The bottom line of everything that Jesus is seeking through his red letters is your heart. That's what he's after. Jesus wants your heart. And he does not want to be second place in your heart. He wants to be first place. And I would venture to say that if you really evaluate what Jesus has to say about the heart, he's not even seeking that you would invite him into your heart. Instead, he's asking that you would give him your life and present your heart as a throne for him to be seated upon. There's a little bit of a difference because when you're just all about, hey, Jesus, come into my heart, you're going to quickly discover there is not enough room. But when you give him your life and you offer him your heart, he then takes it as a throne for which he can begin to establish his will for you. And so something to think about is the Bible teaches that if we are to be saved, then we have to believe that Jesus is our Savior. So in other words, Jesus, will you forgive me of my sins? And then believe that he's willing to do it with all your heart. But the second part of that, to be saved, is you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. Now notice this, not just that he's your Savior, but that he's your Lord. And so, you know, most of us are, have been born and raised in America, and there's a problem with that because we think democratically. We think we get a vote. We think we get a say. We think that what our opinion matters. But when you have a Lord or you have a king, your opinion is domineered by that of the Lord and the king. And so when you're saying, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my king, you're saying, I'm giving up my ambition, I'm giving up my agenda, and I want God's will to be done in my life. Not my will, but his will be done. And so if we are to present our heart to Jesus, uh, the Lord has some things to teach about how he can be king of our heart. For instance, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, most famous message Jesus ever preached. It's the first one that's recorded in the Gospels of him beginning his preaching ministry. Probably the best collection of those words is in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And one of the things Jesus says in that is, you have heard it said that you should not murder. But I say to you that you should not hate in your heart. So what Jesus is saying is, okay, you can honor the, the, one of the Ten Commandments, do not murder, definitely should not murder people. Can I get an amen? amen? But Jesus is saying, if you hate somebody in your heart, you're as guilty as the murderer. Also, Jesus said, you've heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that you should not lust after someone in your heart. So he's saying, don't commit the act of adultery, but also realize God doesn't have your heart until you've dealt with the lust that is giving your heart issues. 
And so in this vein of trying to give our whole heart to Jesus and allow him to truly be the Lord of our life, one of the things you're going to discover is when Jesus starts addressing the subject of the heart, he repetitively brings up one subject over and over and over again to the point that it becomes the second most talked about subject in his entire preaching ministry. And the anchor for it is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The second, according to scholars, the second most talked about subject in all of the red letters is the subject of finances. And many times Jesus is specifically dealing with how that when we handle them, it affects our ability to receive his kingdom and his kingdom of heaven being established in our earthly lives. And so Jesus might have liked to talk about it, but I'm going to be straight up with you. I don't like to talk about it. In fact, I hate to talk about it. In fact, I've been up transparently since 2.30 this morning wrestling with the Lord, pleading with him to let me preach one of the other messages that I have prepared in the vein of red letters. Because here's the thing. When you start talking about finances, people get weird. The room gets awkward. Nobody says amen. It's just weird. And then, especially from the role of pastoral ministry, you know, people always think you have some kind of weird motive or that you're just trying to raise more funds for the church. So let me just give you a disclaimer straight up. This is not so that you will give more funds to the church. That is not what this message is about. I thank you for your generosity. You guys have been amazing. We're going to keep plundering hell and populating heaven. I want to deal with this subject this morning because God has wrecked my world. And early this morning, as I was still fighting with God, one of the things the Lord took me back to was when I was about 18 years old. I was a teenager. And this subject, somebody taught me some things. And God even spoke to me through a word of prophecy in this subject. And it changed my life revolutionized my life. And so I get it. When you hear me saying, say, like I was even sitting over there beside my son a minute ago. He's 16 years old, just started driving, clear the roads. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm getting ready to preach on a subject. My son don't even have a job. And so not to call out Dawson for not having a job. <laughs> Basketball is his job in Jesus' name. And someday it's going to pay for his college education. Lord, let it be. And you know, <laughs> But I was thinking about, like, when I start talking about finances, like, uh, what, what's, what's, what's he going to, what's he, what's he thinking about that? And then others of you, you're like, hey, I, man, I, this subject, it's totally out. Here's the thing. When I was 12 years old, I had a father who sat me down and taught me some of the things I want to share with you today. And it established principles in my life that I'll be honest with you, I struggled with. And yet, as I began to live them out, I saw that there's some things here that if we're going to be a disciple of Christ, we got to know. So here's the deal. That, that verse, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, for where your treasure is also, there your, or excuse me, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's read it in context. Let's start with verse 19. Do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I think that context is important. Now watch what Jesus says three verses later. No one can serve two masters. For he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And watch what he calls the two masters. You cannot serve God and money. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying there's two masters. One is God and the other is your financial means. And you kind of have to make a decision which one of those is going to be the Lord of your life because rarely are they going to line up when you're trying to give your heart to God. And so what I want you to understand is that when Jesus deals with this subject, he's dealing with it in a way where he's not so much concerned about quantity as he is about quality. So in other words, it's not how much you give, but rather the heart from which you give. So look at this passage when Jesus proves this. It's in Mark chapter 12. Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money in the offering box. So just imagine we have these giving kiosks set up, these bar tops. Just imagine Jesus just goes and just kind of leans over on it and says, 
Hey, big boy, what you going to drop in? <laughs> That's what's happening. And as it transpired, it says many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came, and she put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. Some would say a widow's mite. And he called his disciples to him, and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Man, what a passage that Jesus is saying, it's not about the quantity, it's about the quality. It's about, is it coming from your heart or is it not coming from your heart? And he's saying all these people were passing by and they were giving these big showy amounts and Jesus says, but they're living in abundance. On the other hand, there's this other woman who's greatly struggling and she just simply gives what she can and Jesus stops everything and says, now you know what giving looks like. Now you know what generosity looks like. Now you know what worshiping through your giving looks like. And so you may be a person, you don't feel like you're of great means, and yet if you're giving from your heart, Jesus says, I'll stop the whole parade and say, that's what giving is supposed to look like. That's when he knows he has your heart. And that can start for you at any age and any place in life. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is once again moved by someone's radical generosity and how it's connected to their heart. In verse 20, chapter, verse 6 of chapter 26, now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head, and he reclined, he reclined at the table. Then the disciples saw it, and they were indignant, and they said, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Truly I say to you, this is incredible. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Like Jesus is saying, wherever you preach the gospel, wherever you let people know about the opportunities for salvation, also mention this woman because she knows what it is to give truly from your heart to the point that she, she understood how to connect her generosity to her worship. Think about that for a moment. That it wasn't just something that she was checking a box or doing because some religious leader told her it would be a good idea or something that she read in a, a devotional one day. Like this is coming from her heart. And Jesus says, so to this point, this is such a key part of Jesus having your heart. He's saying, wherever you preach the gospel, tell this story. And so to think about for a moment that what some people were calling waste, Jesus was calling worship. And the point of it is this, greedy people will never understand worshipful generosity. And one of the things we try to do as a church, we've tried to put this in the culture, that when there's a time to receive an offering, that we mention that you have the opportunity to worship through your giving, because it is meant to be an act of worship. It's not just something that you're doing as a religious formality. It's a moment where you get to open up your heart and say, hey God, you still own my heart. And it may be a little or it may be a lot, but God, you still own my heart. And so when you start realizing that like generosity can be an act of worship, I think it's also really important to point out it's not meant to be for show. And it's not meant to be so that you can get the accolades of people. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, watch what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that, watch this, they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you that they have received their reward, but when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So what happened in this day is the Pharisees, which were kind of the religious elite of the gatherings of the people, would be these folks that they wanted to put on a big show. So they would get a parade of themselves together. They would sound a trumpet, and the trumpet meant all the beggars were supposed to come, all the impoverished people were supposed to come, and they would walk down the street, and they would start tossing coins at people. 
And then people would start being blown away by how generous they were and what a blessing it was and how much it helped them. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm looking for. This is not about parading your generosity. It's not about blowing a trumpet. So in other words, if you're going to help the poor, stay off Facebook. Like it's not the moment to try and get somebody to talk about what a wonderful person you are. It's about don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But this is where it can get confusing. Because in the book of Acts, when the early church was giving... The way that they would give is they actually would come and place their giving in front of their leadership. And so, well, wait a second. If, if nobody's supposed to know what I'm giving, then why in this element, left hand don't know what right hand's doing, but this hand, it's being placed before leadership. Well, there's, you have to understand the Bible teaches different types of giving. And so in Matthew chapter 6, there's a specific type of giving that is being presented. It is giving to the needy. But the Bible talks about three types of giving. And we talked last week about how a threefold cord through Jesus' teaching could put together stuff that would cause your relationships to not be broken. I want to share with you three threads that are in Scripture that if you tie them together, it's going to help you to keep your generosity from getting broken and torn apart when the world starts messing with you and pulling on you and trying to make you greedy instead of generous. And so the first type of giving that's mentioned in Scripture, or the first one we're going to talk about, is tithes. And so what, what tithes is, um, it, the strongest evidence we have for it is Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring the tithe into the storehouse and God will open up the windows of heaven over your life and he'll bless you to the point you won't have room enough to contain and he will rebuke the devourer off of what remains. That's a pretty good promise. Can I get an amen? But what I want them to do, I want them to pull up what the, 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 the dimes. Okay, so it's back here. All right. So that, that is $1. Ten dimes. I realize, like, you know what generation you're from if you can still count change. But in Scripture, the context is that you... I'm going to walk back here. I don't know if you can see me or not. But the context is, okay, Lord, out of, out of every ten dimes I receive in my life, I'm going to pull one out, and I'm going to honor you with it through worship. Here's the thing. It can't be the last dime. According to Scripture, it must be the first dime. And so for every 10 dimes I receive, I'm going to pull one dime out and I'm going to give it to the Lord. How many would agree with me that that sounds like a great idea until you get a bunch of dimes? And that's what happens to us. We, we don't learn how to be faithful in a few things, so we can't be trusted in being made ruler over many because when it was just a dime... We didn't think it was enough to matter. And the Lord was saying, I was never interested in the quantity. I was always interested in your heart. Now, there's a second type of giving. If they can pull that second slide up. So let's say that you're, you're one of those folks. You're like, okay, I, I'm going to give that first dime to the Lord. Well, this is what remains. You got 90 cents left. And so now you get a second type of giving opportunity, which is called the offering. And what we miss in Malachi 3 is it says bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse and then you get all those promises. So God's basically saying put the tithe in one hand, put the offering in the other, and then bring it as a presentation to, for, to further ministry and I'm going to bring those blessings into your life. But, but the thing is, now when it comes to the offering, you get to choose. Is it a penny off every dollar? Is it a few pennies off every dollar? Are you feeling super generous? It's going to be a couple of nickels. Are you feeling radically generous? It's going to be a quarter. Like you get to determine what the offering is. But the New Testament teaches that the way that that happens is you got to purpose it in your heart and you should do it cheerfully and bountifully, not sparingly. But God says, I want to see somebody with a smile on their face when they start pulling out of what's left. Because what God is saying is when you gave me the, one, the tenth, I blessed the remaining 90. So now whatever you're sowing, whatever you're sowing from is sowing from a blessed place as you step into that agreement of two witnesses, tithe and offering. And so then the third type of giving is the one that's supposed to be, we're supposed to be, have a lot of conviction about, we're not supposed to brag about it, and we're not supposed to let anybody know what's going on, and that is the alm. And that's when we give to the needy. And when we give to the needy, it also comes from that remaining that 90 cents we got on that dollar. And we determine, are we going to clothe the naked? 
Are we going to feed the hungry? Are we going to take care of the widow? Are we going to take care of the orphan? Are we going to care for prisoners? And so what happens is when you really embrace these three aspects of giving, God starts tying together something in your life that the enemy can't so easily tear apart. And our church, like what we've tried to do through Captivate, is to create an arm that allows us to be able to do those things that help the needy. And we realize some of that we have to communicate. But there is so much that goes on in helping people that is never communicated to the mass public, all because you guys have said, I am going to make sure that the naked are clothed, the hungry are fed, that the prisoners are visited, the widows are cared for, and the orphans are taken care of. And whether that's taking care of somebody millions of miles away or thousands of miles away, or it's taking care of somebody right down the road, it's an opportunity for us to be able to help the needy. So, so I hope that makes sense to you and what I would give you is just a couple of visualizations of kind of trying to keep our heart right. Charles Spurgeon wrote a story about a gardener who grew this beautiful carrot. And after he grew the carrot, the king was passing by, and it was the most beautiful carrot he'd ever grown. It was, a, it was the largest carrot he'd ever grown. And he just thought, man, what an opportunity for me to bless the king. And so as the king passes by, he gets permission to approach, and he presents the carrot. He says, this is the best that I have to offer. It's the largest carrot I've ever grown. It's the most beautiful carrot I've ever grown. The king was so moved that he stopped and he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a room in the palace and I'm going to gift you the garden beside my courtyard. The neighbor who raised horses saw this happening. He's like, my goodness, if the king will do that for a carrot, what would he do for a horse? And so he started prepping the horses in his stable. The next time the king comes by, he comes out with the best horse he's ever raised, the most beautiful horse he's ever raised, the most expensive horse he's ever raised. He approaches the king, he presents it. The king says, thank you, and leaves. And the, the guy who raised the horses is so confused, he's absolutely bewildered. The next time the king comes by, he senses the bewilderment. And he says to the man, he said, the reason that I gave the gardener all those things and you receive nothing is because the gardener gave me the carrot. You gave the horse to yourself. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. I'm going to believe some of y'all are slow, but you're worth waiting on. That the point is this, he was being manipulative. And that the only reason he wanted to give was so he could get. And I think even in our relationship with God, we got to be careful with that mess. Because sure, the Lord will bless you, but I don't believe God wants you to call yourself blessed as much as he wants you to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. I heard the story of a little boy. Every time he'd go to church, he'd find Brother George. And he wanted to find Brother George because he liked donuts. And Brother George always had donuts. And so the little boy would go and he'd sit down beside Brother George. And he'd say, Brother George, can I have a donut? And Brother George would cut his donut in half and give him the other half. So one day the little boy comes in. He's got a bag of Cheerios. He sits down beside Brother George, and Brother George said, Hey, hey buddy, can, can I have a Cheerio? The little boy took it out, cut it in half, gave him half a Cheerio. You ever feel like that's kind of how we do God? God's giving us donuts and we're giving him Cheerios? I ain't going to get no help on it. I'm going to get no help. Evidently, this thing about our heart is a very real issue. And it's one that's been occurring in the followers of Jesus for 2,000 years to the point that Jesus had to repetitively address it. And it may have gotten worse instead of better. The latest research shows that only 6% of the followers of Jesus, people who are self-professing Christians, give of tithe, offering, and to help the poor. Only 6%. So maybe there is some kind of a, a challenge in our heart to not really understand Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. They have another graphic. I'm going to ask them if they can pull it up. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, that's an ECG. It's an electrocardiogram. It monitors the heart. It tells you if the heart's healthy. Uh, could you guys pull up the next slide? So you may know what that is. You see, I was praying through and thinking through, and 
you know, even just trying to evaluate my own life and prepping for this message. And I was looking at that ECG and just thinking about, okay, that's what a healthy heart looks like. That's what a healthy heart looks like. And I stumbled upon this. That is actually somebody's giving record. This is a Sunday. This is the week. This is a Sunday. This was a big Wednesday. This was a Sunday. This was a special gift. This was a Sunday. And another gift. And I thought, my mind was blown. And I thought, wow. It really is a heartbeat. And I went into my own life. I started looking at my own track record. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't flatlined. I wanted to make sure that there was a heartbeat, that there was something alive on the inside of me. Because one of the things I'm really grateful for is that from the time I was a young child, as I've mentioned in reference earlier, my dad was teaching me some of these things. And I remember a time in my dad's life, I still lived at home, he actually got a letter from the IRS. And what they were asking him to do was to validate his giving. And what they were basically saying is that we don't see how a man of your income could have given this large a percentage of your income, this much and so they made him like prove all of his giving. When he went back through it, he actually discovered that he had thousands he hadn't even yet turned in. And so I was raised by a man that says you have to prioritize putting God first if your heart's going to be right. And so from the time I was just a child, he was teaching me, Eric, you got to make sure that the Lord owns your heart. And one of the ways you can do that is to make sure that you never get greedy and that you remain generous and that you're always putting the, 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 the worship of giving and helping other people first and and so when, but he taught me, but I didn't get it. Like sometimes I went through the motions of it. First check I ever wrote, 12 years old, was a tithe check. I sold a calf. But I also remember like my dad always lived beneath his means. And I remember being made fun of for the car we drove and being made fun of for the house that we lived in. And I remember thinking to myself like, man, someday I'm going to be somebody. And so I made a decision. I'm going to be an engineer I'm going to own an excavating business. I'm going to broker cattle. And I was head set. I used to drive down Hell's Highway and point out farms I was going to own someday to my parents. For those of you that are not from Russell County, it's not Hell's Highway. It's H-A-L-E-S. I was not trying to own hell, just so you know. <laughs> Culture. Got you scared. And so by the time I was 18... There was a lot of reasons I didn't want to submit to a call to ministry. But a key one was I just didn't want to give up the opportunity to someday be successful. And it was a real struggle. And so one night I was sitting in a church of about 50 people and God started dealing with me about the call to ministry. And I didn't want to hear it. And I was getting aggravated, and I was getting upset. And I was like, God, why will you not just leave me alone with this? Like, I don't want to do this. And I got up and slipped out. And I knew if my father found out, I was in big trouble, even at 18. But I did it anyway. Little did I know that the preacher that night was going to close his message and ask for me to come forward. They couldn't find me. And so my mom and dad came forward. And he began to speak into their life. He said, when you get home, I want you to find Eric. I want you to ask him to take out his billfold. And I want you to tell him the Lord says that if he will do what he's asking him to do, that the Lord will always provide. And I remember my dad, who's a man of few words, coming in and calling me in the living room and, and putting that billfold in my hand and speaking those things. And I got so mad. I was like, I don't want to hear this. Like, I, I don't want anything to do with this. Like, just leave me alone. But it had an effect. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. Because just a couple of weeks later, mile marker 82 on the Cumberland Parkway happened, and I pulled my, li my life over on the side of the road. And two weeks later, 
preached my first sermon, and within a matter of weeks had totally redirected my life and stepped away from pursuing engineering and all the other stuff and said, I'll do whatever I got to do for the rest of my life to honor God. And when my wife and I got married two years later, I remember we, we took everything we had, everything we had, and zeroed every balance we had, and we laid it on an altar and said, if we're going to do this thing, we're going to do this thing trusting God, and we're going to seek God first, and we're going to see God's hand bring this thing to pass. And I, I, I share, I, I, all of our stories are going to look different. My story is going to look different than yours. Your story is going to look different than mine. God's not calling all of us to full-time ministry. But what I am telling you is this. God has honored his word in my life. And it's happened throughout 25 years of the Lord sometimes saying, flip this house. Flip that house, invest in this, invest in that, start this consulting business, work with this individual. And the next thing I would know is I find myself standing in places that I don't deserve and that I'm not worthy of. And there's only one explanation and that is the mighty hand of God, that it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by his spirit. You cannot go wrong putting God first. And I'll make you this promise. You cannot outgive God. Because I don't care what you put on the altar, he put his son on the altar. He so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. So I plead with you, regardless of what place you're at in life, don't wait until you're a person of abundance to finally decide, I'm going to honor the Lord. But decide wherever you're at right now, draw a line in the sand and say, God, I give you my heart starting right now. Jesus seems to like that thing to the point that in Matthew 26, 13, I remind you, he said of that woman, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. I give you one final scenario this morning. I've always been intrigued by the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a short guy. He was a tax collector, which means that he partnered with the Roman Empire to take advantage of people. He was basically robbing people with a cause under the legality of the law of that time. And so what happened is that he hears about Jesus and his heart's moved and he realizes there's some changes that need to take place. And what he does is he actually climbs up in a tree. He's covering up his short stature, trying to appear taller than what he is. And Jesus stops by and the Greek points out Jesus did not affirm him. Jesus did not celebrate him. Jesus corrected him and said, get down immediately. And then we pick it up as they begin their conversation in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read verse 6. And so Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled and said, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And yet Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord in his short stature, in not being tall enough, he stood and embraced his human flaws and his human shortcomings and said, Lord, the half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. It is possible to step into a place where that something stands between you and your honoring of the Lord. And for Zacchaeus, it was this thing, I gotta be taller than what I am. I gotta cover up the fact that everybody thinks I'm short. I gotta get up in a tree and make it look like I am a somebody. The beginning stages of my journey with God look a lot more like Zacchaeus than what I care to admit. And over and over again, I've, had the Lord to remind me, get down out of the tree. Get down out of the tree. And whatever it is I'm asking of you next, just lay it on the altar. And he has been faithful and just to let his presence visit the house over and over and over again. And so this morning, I just want to pray with you and I want to pray for you. I, I felt like this morning in, in trying to prep to preach this that I was going to run into people through the privilege of preaching the gospel that 
you are going through some kind of struggle in your spiritual journey. And you're wrestling with this conviction that you don't even know how to explain or comprehend. And it all is to do with your heart. And I think the Lord would just say to you, give me your life and I'll take your heart as a throne. Lord, we all come from different places, different backgrounds, different means. And yet we all have some of the very same similar struggles. And we confess those before you right now, God. These things that have kept us from following you, from obeying your word, from being obedient to what it was that you wanted of us next. And Lord, what we offer today is a heart that's yielded, a heart that's surrendered. And we would just say, God, whatever you want from us next, may we be somebody with a big yes. And so, Lord, I realize that there may also be people today that have really never had a relationship with you. And I would ask them that you would show them the radical sacrifice of heaven, the blood of your son shed on a hill called Calvary, shed so that we might have life and escape death. God, you took the wrath of heaven towards sin and gave us an exit opportunity. But we got to ask you to forgive us. We got to believe in our heart that you're willing to do it. And God, somebody right now is praying that prayer. I ask you, give them the courage, God. Give them the faith. God, provoke them by the power of your Holy Spirit to finally surrender their life to you. God, may they lift a hand and yield to you in this moment, not so a preacher can see it, not so a church can count it, but so that heaven will know. Right here's a heart that's yielding. And God, in this moment, I pray that they would arise and decree and declare to anybody and everybody, Jesus is my Lord. He's not third place. He's not second place. He's first place. And my life's going to orbit around him from this moment forward. Jesus, be the king of our hearts today. And God, for those of us that have been serving you for a while, take our discipleship to the next level. Give us ears to hear your voice. And may we respond in a way that's pleasing to heaven. In Jesus' name, this church said, amen.